Pops. It's good to have everyone who's here with us this morning in the house. Glad to have you guys who are online with us. Thank you so much for joining us. We're going to have a great day together as we get into the Word this morning. And then worship today is going to be so powerful. I'm really looking forward to that. So make sure you stick around for our worship uh, segment that's going to be uh, after the preaching. It's going to be worth your time to stick around. I'll guarantee you that. So this morning, I have several things that I want to get to before we get to the message. I have a couple of important announcements that I'm really excited about. And the first one is that we have a men's conference coming up. I want to hear all the men say, woo hoo <laughs> Yeah, at home, I want to hear you, woo hoo <laughs> A men's conference is coming up, and I'm excited about that. 360-man conference, that's going to be on a Friday night here at the church, September 11th. Uh, We're going to meet at 6 o'clock. We're going to eat together. There's a live service at 7 o'clock that will be streamed, and I'm so excited. It's going to be a great time. We've been locked up so long, and it's going to be great to have a a chance for us to get together and to do some things uh, with each other, and I'm just really excited. The Alabama District is putting this together, and I'm so grateful Uh, that they are putting together this conference and and making it available to all of the churches. I just want to check something. Are we live streaming or are we having some issues? Looks good? All right. Making sure. We had issues last week, so I wanted to make sure we're streaming and everything's good. So, guys, make sure you mark that on your calendar. That's Friday night, September 11th. We'll be here at the church, 6 o'clock. We're going to eat together, and um, and we're going to meet for a live service at 7 o'clock here in the sanctuary. Now, here's what I would like you to do, because if we're going to eat, we need to know how much food. So that means I need you guys to register. You'll go to our website, horizonchurch.tv. Right on the front page, you're going to see a a logo that says men's conference, and it says register here. Just click on that link. It's very quick. You just need to put your name and email address and how many guys are coming, because some of you guys might bring sons or uh, older sons or whatever. We will not have child care. And just because of the circumstances, we will still be social distancing and uh, grow as men together. So I'm excited about this. So mark it on your calendar. Register on the website so that I know you're coming, because we want to be prepared for how many guys are going to be here. Now, the second thing is this. There's also a women's conference. Now I want to hear all the women. Yeah. Oh, hey, I think we got a better response from the ladies. That's awesome. So ladies at home, ladies here, make sure you mark your calendar for September 18th. Same deal. You'll meet here at the church on a Friday night at 6 o'clock, and then uh, you'll have some food together, and then come in the sanctuary, and we'll have a live service streamed uh, by video, and everyone will be able to participate. Ladies, it's going to be a fun night. Again, our district is putting this on. Now, the speaker for the men's meeting is um, going to be Rick DeVoe. He is the assistant general superintendent for the Assemblies of God. Wow, what a great speaker. I've heard him before. He's dynamic. You're going to really be blessed with this speaker for the men's conference. And then you can see Beth Stevens is the speaker for the women's conference. So, ladies, that's, that's your speaker. I, I, these are going to be great events, and I'm so excited because normally our church has events throughout the year, and we haven't been able to do anything, and so it's been kind of frustrating, but we're kind of trying to get back into the groove of, of having some things going on, and uh, things that you can get engaged with and be involved in, so that's coming up. I'm really excited about it. Now, I want to mention another thing. Uh, I got a call from Joel Montgomery. And he is offering something fantastic for our church. Now, remember, just recently, the last series we did was called uh, Destinations. We were talking about purpose, how we're uh, trying to find our purpose in our life that that God has given us. Joel and Elaine have developed a course, an online course, called How to Do Family on Purpose. And guess what? They're bringing this course here to our church for our, our folks And we're going to do this together as a church, each family participating in this journey. Uh, They have uh, worked on this with couples all around the world. And so now they're bringing this online course to our church. And I'm so excited about it. So what we're going to do is we're going to start this course together as a church on uh, September 13th. 
I have a special message that day that is kind of relate to families, and then we start this course on families, uh, finding purpose in families. And here's, here's kind of what you can expect. Each week, you and your spouse will spend about an hour watching a video and completing some exercises together. And those, uh, those exercises are, over the six weeks are gonna help you define three very important things. Where are you headed as a family? What you believe as a family? And then which habits will take you to where you want to be as a family? So it's a really cool process to help you figure out what your purpose is as a family and kind of how you develop those habits and things you need in your life to move you forward to where you need to be. Now, the course normally costs $397, but here's the deal. They're giving you a special discount, and this is a promo code only for our church, $37. Can you believe that? $37 for a course that normally costs $397. So I'm excited about this because it's such an incredible value. So you're going to get some instructions in the mail, in the email um, this coming week that will give you some uh, information about how to register. You'll get a coupon code and how you sign up for it. And, and here's something else that, that Joel shared with me. And I I, I thought this was so amazing. He said, I really want to take all of the money that comes in from this course and turn it back to the church. Yeah. I was like, wow, what an amazing act of generosity. So I'm so excited about it. So not only are you going to benefit by receiving something that's of great value for your family, but then what you invest in it will also be invested in your church. And so what, it's a win for everyone, and I think it's fantastic. So uh, please say thank you to Joel and Elaine for offering such an incredible value to our church and let them know you appreciate what they're doing for us. And uh, thank you so much, Joel and Elaine. We really appreciate this incredible opportunity. <laughs> Amen. If you didn't hear it, Joel, everybody in the church just clapped for you. So... <laughs> So don't forget about that. You'll get more details coming up soon about that. Now, this morning, before we get into the message, we also have a kids' lesson today from Katrini. So let's go ahead and let's show this video for the kids this morning. You know this. If you ever attended one of my classes, if you have ever been to kids' church, or if you've ever heard me preaching, you know that I used to be scared of everything when I was a little child, it's even things from the Bible, even Bible verses would give me terror and make me anxious. Like the eyes of the Lord are above the earth, uh, upon the earth. And I would be like, oh, God, this is talking me. I cannot say anything wrong. I cannot do anything wrong because God is looking at me. You're just ready to crush me. That's what I would think. That's not true. Another thing. I remember I was in this youth service when I was a little child and they were doing this drama. The boy was dressed like Jesus and he was judging people and people would be saved and people would not be saved. And for those who were not saved, he would say like, go away from me. I never knew you. And that struck me with horror. I'm like, oh, how can God not know someone? How can, and, and I, I was so confused. And I asked, I remember I asked my parents and they say, it's in the Bible. And I went to read that and you can find this in Matthew chapter seven verses. Uh, you can see a little bit on verses 22 and 23. And it says like, many will say to me on that day, that's Jesus saying, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name, drive out demons. And in your name, perform many miracles. Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. I was horrified. First, because the thought of Jesus, God, not knowing someone. I was like, how is that even possible? God knows everybody. 
God sees everybody. He knows everything that's going on. And it took me a while to understand something. God does see everybody. But it's like us. We see many people around us. But do you know everybody around you? Do you know what's in their hearts? Do you know what's going on in their minds? Do you know what they where they live, what they do with their lives, what their plans for the future? Do you? Like famous people on, on TV. Can you call anyone like a famous person? Do you, you know, think about your favorite actor or actress or singer. If you call them right now and say, hey, this is me. Will they say, hey, my friend, how are you? Or they're going to say, uh, I'm sorry, I don't know you. What's going to be the answer? So my conclusion is God, he created us for relationship. He wants to know us and we are supposed to know him. But how can we know God, especially through the Bible and through prayer? And prayer is the key for both knowing God's heart, his will for us, and also to make us known to him. Because let me tell you something, my friend. God, he wants to hear your voice. The Bible says that he knows what we need even before we say it. But it doesn't mean that he doesn't want to hear from us. Yes, he wants to hear what's going on in your mind, what's in your heart, what you're scared of, what you dream of. He wants to know you. Tell him. Tell him today what's in your heart what's in your mind and ask him to tell you what's in his heart and what's in his mind because that's the secret to spend eternity with him because here on the chapter seven he says that the eternity is for those who know and do his will so today spend some time in his presence and say god show me your will help me to do your will Help me to be known by you and help me to know you more today. So that's what I want to tell you today. And may God bless you. Have a blessed week. Amen. That was fantastic. Thank you so much. It's, you know, we say it's for the kids, but come on. <laughs> it's always for all of us. So we appreciate it very much. Thank you for providing these lessons for the kids and for us too. Um, I want to mention one more thing before we get into the message this morning. If you're with us online and it's your first time being with us, thank you so much for joining us. And you might be seeing us on YouTube or Facebook, or maybe you found us on our website. But if you, if you haven't found us on our website and you're brand new, I would like you to do something for me. If you would go to our website, horizonchurch.tv, there's a button that says live streaming. Click on that, and then underneath the video, there's a little blue button that says I'm new. And if you would click on that, I would really appreciate it. Just let us uh, get some contact information because we want to thank you personally for joining us, and we want to kind of keep you up to date on the things that are going on in our church. So, But thank you so much for being with us today, and thank you to everybody who's joining us here and at home. And also, I want to say thanks to everyone who supports us with your tithes and your offerings. Your, uh, your contributions and your generosity are so important, and we appreciate it so very much. We are able to continue doing ministry. We're able to support missionaries and do so much because you guys are giving and you're being so generous about it. So thank you for supporting us. And if you don't know already, there's a button on our webpage that says online giving. It's safe and it's simple, and you can do your uh, online giving there or send in a check. Or today, if you're here, you can put your offering in the box out in the foyer. All right, guys, we're going to continue the series that we started last week, and the series is called Time to Bloom. And the idea is that uh, Paul is talking in, in the book of Ephesians about how we need to grow personally in our faith, in our walk with God. God wants us not just to, to be a seed in the ground. Someone say amen. amen. But God wants us to grow and not just grow, but bloom, to be successful. And that's what he's calling us to. 
This year marks the 30th anniversary of the Hubble telescope. It was launched into space in 1990, and uh, this is a really incredible uh, thing for astronomy. Astronomy's kind of been a hobby of mine since I was a kid. I've always enjoyed it. But there's a, there's a problem with having telescopes on Earth. There's several problems. One of them is the atmosphere distorts the images a little bit. And so we can't get as clear of a picture as we would like to. And then you have to deal with weather. Jan and I were out west earlier this summer, and I was so excited because I was looking forward to seeing some dark skies. We're in Birmingham, Alabama. It is not dark at night. You can see a few stars. And a few weeks ago, I had my telescope out, and I looked at Saturn and Jupiter. But you can't really see anything really amazing because it's just too bright. So we have, we're losing dark skies all around our planet because of light pollution and because of the weather. Sometimes you just can't see what you want to see. So there are limitations to Earth telescopes. But when you put a telescope above the atmosphere, above the weather, and beyond light pollution, you should be able to get some really great pictures of the universe. I mean, this is God's creation after all, right? We want to see what it looks like. So uh, the project started in 1978, took 12 years before they launched it, and $2.2 billion. But we got a telescope up in, in, in orbit. So they decided uh, to take their first image, and it wasn't supposed to really be broadcast to the public, but it was. And so here's the first image that, that came through on the Hubble Space Telescope. Now, it looks pretty bland, right? The image you see on the left is from a ground telescope. The image on the right is from the space telescope. Now, you can see that the space telescope, the Hubble telescope image, looks a little better than the ground one. It's 50% better. But this image wasn't meant to go into the public. And NASA said, this is an image that we take to check the optics, check all of the glass, make sure everything is working correctly. It's kind of like, you know, just calibrating. And they said, we're going to work on calibrating this telescope until we get the images sharper and clearer and better. But there was a problem. They couldn't get the images sharper. They couldn't get it more clear. In fact, look at this image of Galaxy M100. It's really blurry. Now, would you be happy if you spent 12 years and $2.2 billion and this is the photograph you got? No. People were very upset with this, this problem. So NASA did some research, and here's what they figured out. During the process of producing this telescope, when they were making the main mirror, there was a flaw, a mistake. They, they, did, they polished it out of tolerance by two microns on the outer edge. Now, if you don't know what microns are, think of it this way. Two microns is about 50 times smaller than the width of a human hair. That's like a little tiny bit, but that little tiny mistake created a huge problem. It took three years for NASA to develop a solution, and they had to send a team of astronauts into space, open the telescope, and put in some corrective lenses, like contact lenses, <laughs> glasses for the telescope, to fix the problem. But thank the Lord they did, because look at what happened. The same picture after the correction is so different. Isn't that amazing? So it went on to, of course, you know, 30 years of, of taking images. Let's show the next slide. Uh, NASA has taken some incredible images of the universe, God's amazing creation. And I think my favorite one is that one that you see on the bottom left. That is just a tiny piece of dark sky up somewhere. It's just a little spot. If you look at it with your eyes, you don't see anything. But when they looked at it with the telescope, Hubble telescope, they saw this. Those are not, those, all those little dots, they're not stars. They're galaxies. Wow. This is an image of 10,000 galaxies in one little spot in the universe. Is God amazing or what? 
How incredible. But here's the thing. A mistake made the, the images useless. They made them flawed. What happens when you and I live our life filled with mistakes? What happens? We, everything we produce is flawed. Everything we do is distorted. It's out of focus. It's blurry. When our life is without Jesus, we are like that blurry picture I showed you earlier. When people see us trying to uh, do something in life, we, we are really an out of focus, blurry picture of what we could be. God doesn't want us to be out of focus. He wants us to be sharp. He wants us to be clear so that we reflect clearly the image of Jesus in our lives. And that's, that's kind of what we're going to be talking about today. Paul wants us to understand that we need to mature in our walk with Jesus. And that means that sometimes we have to make changes. Sometimes we have to make corrections. And it's more than just putting in a set of contact lenses or glasses. It's a change in the heart. But that's what the Holy Spirit does for us. Amen? So let's take a look at what, what it says. In Ephesians 4.17 is where we start. It says, So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do, in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Now, Paul is writing to uh, Gentiles, but he says to them, don't live like the Gentiles. Now, that sounds a little bit weird. Why does he say that to them? The reason he says that to them is because he's talking about the way the Gentiles in general live who don't have God, because they are pagans, and they follow after other gods. And the people that Paul was writing to, these Ephesians, used to live that way. They used to be without Jesus. They used to walk in their life as the pagans walk, and they did not understand the truth. And because of their ignorance, they lived their, their lives uh, in, a, in a horrible way. So let's go on to verse 19. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they're full of greed. Because of their inability to see the world clearly, because they didn't have Jesus in their lives, everything they did was distorted. Everything they did was corrupted by the sinful nature in their heart. And that's how you and I used to live as well. We know what it's like to have sinful desires in our heart that pull us in the wrong direction to do the wrong things. Greed comes about because of our selfish desires that are inside of us that we allow those to take over our life. So this is what Paul is talking about. But let's look at verse 20 and 21. That, however, is not the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You see, those who, uh, those who have accepted Jesus don't live in the dark anymore because our eyes have been opened to the truth and we see the light. How many of you remember that old hymn, Amazing Grace? I mean, everybody knows this song, right? One of the lines in the song says, I once was blind, but now I see. What an incredible line. And what an accurate statement of life without Jesus and life with Jesus. I once was blind, but now I see. Now I get it. Paul talks about this in another letter of his in 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, he says, The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. People who are not Christians don't have the Holy Spirit in their heart. So guess what? They have a distorted view of who God is. They don't understand who Jesus is. 
And when you try to explain it to them, they just don't get it. They need a revelation from the Holy Spirit to open their eyes and their hearts and minds to receive the truth. When I'm praying for someone that is not a Christian, that I'm, I'm praying for their salvation, I will oftentimes pray and say, Lord, would you please open their blinded eyes? Help them to see the truth. Open their, their uh, chained hearts so that they could receive the truth about Jesus. We need to pray for people to be released from the enemy because Satan doesn't want us to know the truth, right? He wants us to live in, in darkness. But when the Holy Spirit comes into our life, he reveals everything. He is light, and he helps us to see the truth. So we, we have been given the light. We have the Holy Spirit living in us. We now live according to uh, the way God has asked us to live. We've, we've been, uh, we've been uh, illuminated. Our, our mind, our eyes, our heart, everything's open now. We can see truth. So what is that supposed to do to us? What kind of changes are supposed to happen in us? Paul talks about that next. So let's look at Ephesians 4, 22 through 24. To put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Spiritual maturity requires Change and transformation. Spiritual maturity requires us to grow. We have to move forward. So in this, this section, Paul gives three keys that are critical, very important, if we're going to make a, a progress in our spiritual life. If we're going to grow, if we're going to mature, these three keys have to be active in our life. The first one is this. Put off the old self. Put off the old self. When you and I became Christians, followers of Jesus, when we got saved, our life was totally transformed. Jesus came in. He took away our sins. He forgave us. He made us holy. But does that mean that every evil desire left you completely? <laughs> no, some people are laughing. They know it's not true. We, we know that's not true because we still struggle, don't we? Yes. So what happens? We have to actively work to take the old habits off. We have to get rid of them. Well, what does that look like? Well, that means sometimes... Now, here's the thing. It looks different for everybody. Your old habits are different from my old habits. Your temptations are different from my temptations. But in general, we can say this. If we're going to take off the old, then that means we've got to make some changes. And we've got to do something, everything we can, to get rid of our old desires and temptations. So the things that used to um, cause us problems, we have to deal with. We need to change old habits. Maybe you were going to places that uh, were bad for you. And those, those are bad habits that you have to overcome, so stop going there. Maybe uh, there are some things that you need to put away from your life, things like alcohol or drugs that control your life. There are things that we have to get rid of that used to control us, things that were um, habits that got hold of us. But we also need to get rid of temptations. There might be some things in your house that need to go. I mean, take an inventory. Look around. What are some things in your house that draw you back to that old life? Anything that pulls you backwards needs to be gotten rid of. Like an old coat, it needs to come off and be thrown away, done away with. Maybe there are some people that you used to hang out with who caused problems because they always pulled you in the wrong direction. I hate to say it, but sometimes... You don't have a choice but to cut that off. You know, at some point, 
the hope and prayer is that you could reach out to that person and share the love of Jesus with them. But while you're trying to grow, while you're trying to change your habits, while you're trying to make progress, and that person is bringing you back down again, then you've got to step back and say, wait, I, I, I can't do this right now. So take off the old. Then the second thing that he said is to renew your minds. Now, this is really critical because you might say to yourself, well, how do I take off all those old habits? Because there's so much a part of who I am. I don't know how to get rid of those. But what you need is your mind to be renewed. Yeah. We need a new mind. And this is the job of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit comes in and he helps to rewire our brain so that, remember, now we can see. Now we can understand. Now we can make sense of the world and see it the way Jesus wants us to see it. So we need the Lord to open our minds and renew our minds so that we can understand truth. And this doesn't happen all at one time. It's just like taking off the old doesn't happen all at one time. It's a process that happens over time. And we allow the Holy Spirit to change us a little bit at a time, over time, and renew us and to make us better people. And it's something that continues to happen throughout our life. Now, how do we get our minds renewed? We have to make a choice, make a decision to allow the Holy Spirit to touch us and change us. And we, and we do that actively by getting into his word and by getting into prayer, spending time with him. When we engage in those things, what happens is the Holy Spirit is able to help us to transform our minds and our thinking. It's kind of like if you went to school and you sat in a classroom, but you never opened the textbook, you didn't listen to the teacher's lectures, you never did the homework, what kind of a grade would you expect to get? F, yeah, fail. And the same thing is true with our spiritual life. You can't just accept Jesus as your Savior and then never engage fully into the Christian life. We have to engage in prayer. We have to engage in the Word of God and in worship and allow these things to transform us and change us. That's how the Holy Spirit gets into uh, our life and helps us to transform. Okay, so the first key is what? Put off the old life. The second key is to have our minds renewed. And the third key is to put on the new life. So all the things we take off, we need to replace with something new. Put on something good. It's, um, it's kind of like restoration, like restoring a house. You, you throw out the old cabinets that don't work. They're falling apart. They're, they're nasty and grimy. And what do you do? You get new ones and you bring them in and you set them in place of the old so that the kitchen is usable now. So our life is like this. We need to renovate. And this is a progress that happens as a cooperation between us and God. Don't expect that the moment you get saved, all of a sudden everything is new. It's something that we have to uh, ask God to continuously help us with. We put on the new all the time. We get rid of bad attitudes. We replace them with good attitudes. We get rid of bad habits and we replace them with good habits. We have to embrace new character in our life. You say, well, what kind of character? The character of Jesus. Remember last week I said that the only standard of measurement for our spiritual growth is the character of Jesus. We're aiming, that's our goal, we're aiming to be like Jesus. And so we want his character to be a part of us. We need our character to be transformed into his character. Put on the new, put on the good. So these three keys are critical if we're going to grow and if we're going to bloom. We need to put off the old, we need to renew our minds, and we need to put on the new. Now, like I said, that is unique for everyone. Your situation is different from my situation. What I go through is different than what you go through. And so 
the Holy Spirit helps us to understand all of these things. Let me, let me also make this very clear. None of this happens out of our own strength only. It's a cooperation. The Lord and us working together. If you try to do this on your own, you're probably not going to be successful. But if you will allow the Holy Spirit to help you, to come alongside of you, man, some great things can happen. Now, Paul goes on to list some specific examples. And I don't want to take a, a ton of time, but I do want us to at least read these and see what he's talking about. This will help us to get an idea of what kind of transformation he's talking about, what kinds of changes he's talking about. So let's just go through these kind of fast. Verse 25 says, Therefore each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. The first thing he mentions is integrity. We have to speak the truth. Uh, I, I've known people uh, who were so accustomed to lying, they, they lied so often that they would tell a lie when it was easier to tell the truth. But it was a part of who, who they were. It was their nature. And lying was just a part of who that person is. We can't live that way because Jesus is not a liar. Right. And if we're going to put on the character of Jesus, we have to put on the character of truth and integrity. Because here's the thing. If we don't speak the truth, we can't build trust in relationships. Paul has spent a lot of time in this letter talking about the unity of the church. The church can't have unity and peace if the people in the church can't be honest with each other. We have to be real. The motto of our church is this, real people, real faith. It's about integrity. It's about being honest. It's about being real. We're not going to pretend to be something that we're not. We're going to embrace reality, and we're going to let Jesus put the character of integrity and truth inside of us. Amen? When we do that, we can grow as a congregation and as a body of believers. Verses 26 and 27. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. Now, this has to deal with our emotions. I want you to pay attention to how this is worded. It does not say, look at it closely. It does not say, do not be angry. God does not expect you and me to be robots with no emotion. He created us to have emotions because God himself has emotions. Jesus became angry. He did. So here's the deal. We, we are going to become angry, and God knows that. But what he wants us to do is to be careful not to allow the anger our emotion, to lead us down the wrong path. You might be angry at your friend. It is not good for you to punch them in the face. <laughs> right? <laughs> okay, we can be angry, but let's work it out. Let's deal with it. And then it says, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. That's a, such great advice. Because the longer we allow anger to sit in our heart, the more it will breed resentment, bitterness, and unforgiveness. You have to deal with it quickly. I, Jan and I have a great marriage. Uh, I'm, I'm so blessed by the Lord to have an amazing wife. But can I just be real with you? Because we're like real people, real faith. Is that okay? We have had arguments. <gasps> After 33 years of marriage, we've had arguments. <laughs> I mean, it's more when we were young, not so much now that we're older, but it still happens occasionally. Can, would, I would love to say to you that we never went to bed angry. I'd really love to say to you that we never went to bed angry. I would be lying, <laughs> and I'm not going to lie to you. There have been times that we went to bed angry. Now, sometimes it went like this. You lay down in the bed like this. Yeah. 
stewing in your mind, thinking about the situation that happened, whatever it was, and you can't sleep. And your wife can't sleep either because she's doing the same thing, making the same face. (laughs) Eventually, one of us will probably say, are we going to talk about this? (laughs) And we talk about it. And we deal with it. And we take care of it. And then we can sleep. But sometimes we roll over, face the other way, and go to sleep angry. We've done that a few times. And I can tell you from experience, don't do that. (laughs) Don't do that because it's so bad the next day. And then you don't want to deal with it. And it goes to the third day. And then you're like, it gets worse and worse. You better deal with it fast because it only wants, here's what the devil wants to do. He wants to put a foot in your marriage and break it apart. And one of the best ways to do that is to get you guys to argue and disagree with each other. Because when we do that, it breaks our unity. But when we resolve problems, when we deal with problems, we strengthen our bond with each other. And we improve our relationship. Now, this is true not just in marriage. This is true in any relationship. If you have a problem with somebody... You need to pray about it, and then you need to go to that person, and and let's deal with it. Let's resolve it and and take care of it. Don't let it sit and grow and, and, and become an opportunity for the enemy to break relationships. All right, I'm going to move a little bit faster. Verse 28. You ever heard a preacher say that before? Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work. Do something useful with their own hands that they may have something to share with those in need. I think it's neat that, that Paul says, not only are you supposed to not steal, obviously, duh, that you're supposed to work with your hands, not just so that you can make enough for yourself, but so that you can share with others, so that you can be a blessing to other people. We oftentimes think that, that what we make with our hands in our work is for us and us alone, and it's not. It's so that God, God blesses you so that you can be a blessing to other people. I think that's really cool. Verse 29. Do not let any, let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. We could do an entire sermon on this verse right here alone. Our words are so powerful. The, okay, I know I said I was going to go fast. Let me, the Holy Spirit just gave me something. Parents, your words to your children are so powerful, especially when they're young. Especially when they're young. Be careful about the things you say and the way you say them. What, did, what does Paul say? Only what is helpful for building others up. Benefit your children by the words you say. Don't crucify them. Don't, I, I, and we're, we're going to cover this more in a couple of weeks. But be careful about the things you say to your kids. Uh, our words are so powerful. I'm going to skip verse 30, come back to it in just a minute. 31 and 32. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. So there are two things, one that you get rid of and one that you put on. What do you get rid of? The slander, the brawling, the anger, all of that stuff, the rage. What do you put on? Forgiveness, compassion, love. These are important. Why do we put that on? Because that's what Jesus gave us. He gave you compassion. He gave you forgiveness, and now you're supposed to give that to others as well. It becomes a part of our character. Now, here's the last verse. We're going to do verse 30 uh, last. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. What does it mean to grieve the Holy Spirit of God? I told you earlier, just a few minutes ago, that, that the Lord has emotions, right? 
He gave us emotions because he himself has emotions. Grieving the Holy Spirit means that we hurt him emotionally. That we cause him sorrow and pain and regret because of our words, our actions, our behavior. If we do things that cause the Lord sorrow and hurt and pain, then we have grieved the Holy Spirit. Think about all the things that we just talked about that we're supposed to do. We're supposed to put off the old life. Let our minds be renewed by the Holy Spirit and put on the new things. What if we keep going back to that old life and try to come back to the new life and back to the old life and back to the new life and back to the old life? Do you know what happens? You and I are grieving the Holy Spirit. If we are unwilling to make that com that commitment to say to the Lord, I'm going to allow you to work in my life and I'm going to grow and I'm going to move forward and become what you want me to be. If we can't make that commitment, we grieve the heart of God. But when we make the commitment to put off the old, renew our minds and put on the new, then God rejoices. Then God is pleased. Every time we engage in his word and allow it to touch our hearts, God rejoices. Every time we meet with him in prayer to seek his face, God rejoices. Every time we share our faith with somebody else, all of heaven rejoices. So if we don't want to grieve the spirit of God, then what we need to do is follow the advice that Paul gave us. Put off the old, renew our minds, and put on the new. Those three keys in our life will make all of the difference in the world. Our worship team is coming now uh, to lead us in worship. And while they're coming, I want to ask you a question. When other people look at your life, what do they see? Do they see clearly a vision of who Jesus is? Or do they say, see a blurry, distorted vision of Jesus? Think about the images I showed you earlier from the Hubble telescope. Those first images were so blurry and out of focus. You couldn't really tell what was going on. Is that what people see when they look at your life and they're trying to see Jesus? Or has the Holy Spirit corrected your life so that when others look at you, what they see is a very clear a very clear image of who Jesus is. We need our life to reflect the true reality of who Christ is. We do that by putting on his character. We do that by growing. We do it by maturing in our life. I believe God wants to do that with you. I challenge you today. I challenge you. Take these words from the Bible to heart. Let the Holy Spirit look inside of you and show you what needs to come off, what needs to change in your mind, and what needs to be put on. Let the Lord transform you from the inside out. And I know that great things are in store for you and for me when we allow the Lord to change us and transform us by his power. been following this journey of a little girl who has liver cancer, and um, she went to the same school as my son, and they found out that they, they're putting her in hospice, and um, it's always that idea of, like, why does God let these things happen, um, and I want to start by saying, first of all, to keep in mind um, that the cross and the resurrection was not a reversal of the defeat but the manifestation of victory. Um, and in that, it's always important to remember when we're facing um, unexplainable pain that God's not the only force that's acting in this world and that Satan is real. And with him, he brings sickness and death. Um, but 
God has already defeated that sickness and death through Jesus. So what seems to us an injustice here on earth doesn't mean that we've lost. He's already declared that victory. And when we watch people pass early, when we watch people go through these pains, that's not a defeat. That's not the reversal of defeat. That's the manifestation of the victory that Jesus has already brought through the cross. Um, the, the other thing is that God is good. Even when we can't see what he's doing, God is good. And that what Satan means for evil, God uses for good. So no matter what you're looking at, no matter what you're facing, just because it looks like it's bad and that it's too much to bear, God is good through that. And we don't know what, you know, what he's working, why he allows these things to happen, but he's good. Um, and then the last thing is that there are things that we're not meant to understand. I was looking at those pictures that the Hubble telescope took of, of the universe, and it's incomprehensible. And the God who created that universe is even more incomprehensible. So if we can't understand the universe that he, we, that he created, we can't understand, we can't understand him, except that we just have to rest in the assurity that he loves us and that he is good. And so I wanted to bring that to you this morning. I really felt the Holy Spirit with that. And um, we're going to sing about how much God loves us. So if you guys will stand and join us in worship today. Let's, let's pray. Jesus, we love you so much, and we thank you for your immense love for us. That we can rest assured that what seems like defeat is not defeat, but that's your victory that you put in place, that you saw from the beginning of time. And Jesus, I put in your hands this little girl, Destiny, and her family who are mourning and going through something that I pray the rest of us never have to experience. Jesus, we put their hearts, their marriage, and their emotions in your hand that you bring them peace, and that you would extend us all the peace and grace that you have already given us and that we would reach out and claim it, God, that we would claim your power and your presence and that you would fill us with the Holy Spirit
idea that this that this life is what we're living for we we confuse that and that confuse it myself because we live in an age where life is good where most of us have plenty to enjoy we have we have plenty of leisure and so we can't imagine heaven being better and so we lose our focus that that's what we're seeking so everything that's good here everything that you enjoy here is is practice it's a taste a small taste of what God has prepared for us in his kingdom I'll set you as a seal upon my heart, as a seal upon my arm. For there is love that is as strong as death, jealousy demanding as the grave.
Aren't you glad we serve an amazing God? He doesn't relent. That means he doesn't stop. He keeps right on coming after us. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, this morning. Thank you for your grace that surrounds us and fills us. Thank you for your compassion and mercy that never give up on us. Thank you, Lord. You continue to work in our lives to make us holy, and you don't give up, Lord. We're so grateful. We're so thankful, Lord. I praise you for who you are and all you have done for us and continue to do in our lives. We give you honor and thanks today. Hallelujah. 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 Let me bless you this morning. Father, I... I ask you now to bless this, this family of God, your children. And in the name of Jesus, may they sense your presence throughout this week as you walk with them. God, they, may they not be overwhelmed by the things that they face this week, but may they be surrounded by the powerful presence of the one who created them. May they be reminded each day of your grace and your presence and your power. In Christ's name we pray, amen, amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. I love you guys. Thank you for being with us here in the church and thank you online for being with us.